All right, so here we are, welcome. Um, first of all, thanks to everyone for being here tonight. Really appreciate it. I want to welcome everybody in the room. And we are live streaming this broadcast, so I want to welcome everybody who's, who's watching this from the uh, comfort of their own homes, uh, or bars, or wherever they're showing us. <laughs> and, uh, uh, <laughs> and I want to thank uh, all those involved in putting this together, the Institutional Advancement staff. In particular, I want to thank uh, Jackie Neal, Gear, class of 2005, undergrad, and class of 2012, master. So, thank you, Jackie. Let's give Jackie a round. So, the agenda for tonight, real fast, is we want to give you a quick update on what's going on at the college, share with you some recent developments, and then most of all, we want to answer your questions, both in the room and those who have questions online. So, uh, let me begin. Uh, as I've talked about, oh, two other things. I want to, I want to acknowledge uh, the, one of our trustees who is here with us, um, Emily Kagan. Emily, thank you for being here. And Pete Duane, the president of the Alumni Association. Pete, thank you for being here. There are a number of other alumni, active alumni in the room, but in, in the interest of time, I'll just keep moving forward. Um, so great things are going on. I've, I've talked to a number of you about this before, but let me just summarize. Enrollments are at the highest levels ever, and an incoming class looks to be just as strong as the last few years. Uh, financially, we're in excellent shape, probably the best shape we've been in financially in the last 20 years. Uh, we, while many colleges are cutting programs and services, we're expanding both our academic programs and our student service programs. So we're very proud of that. Uh, and in terms of facilities, we're probably spending now on average about $2 million a year in facility upgrades. In addition to that, uh, we're bringing uh, uh, the dining uh, room, the dining area, uh, 11, 11 dining, dining hall, uh, is being renovated completely this summer. Uh, and then the new life science building will be online as of a compromise in this art. Summer of 2014. <laughs> I say spring, he says fall, so we'll go with summer. Um, and I just want to acknowledge uh, one of our newest members of our um, staff, um, Patrick Callahan, who is our director of grounds. And I just want to say, Pat, where are you, Patrick? All right. Why don't you stand for a second? Just, he has done a phenomenal job in the space of how many months? Uh, four. Four months. <laughs> just walk around. I don't have to say much more than that. The campus has never looked so good. Thank you. Congratulations. Um, in addition to that, obviously we've had some. Um, um, hello, Joe. How are you? Hey, hello, we've had some uh, fairly strong fundraising success with doubling the annual fund in the last four years, and obviously the, the demo gift. Um, however, however, uh, we also face some strong headwinds. Uh, the, uh, the market is shifting uh, dramatically because of the, the economic impact of the recession. Uh, also the demographics. So what's happening is students are finding it more difficult to get the resources together to um, uh, provide for their education. So there's very, very strong demand on financial aid. So there's upward pressure on financial aid and downward pressure on price. So this whole question of affordability is really hit hard. I'm sure you're reading about it. And it's something we're very concerned about as well. So it's a real demand that we have to look at. How can we improve the value of every student's education and at the same time keep the price of the formula. So this whole question of the value proposition is, is very, very important. Um, also, at the same time, the demographics are such that uh, there's a decline in the 18 to 22 year old group, uh, the current students, the majority of students who come here uh, for college. That group in the Northeast is predicted to decline anywhere from 15 14 to 24 percent over the next decade. So that's a decline in the actual pool of students who are applying. And the major reason for that is they weren't born. Uh, the decline in the birth rate 18 to 22 years ago. So there you go. Uh, and then the last is the decline in, in federal and state support. So 
Well, I'm going to end there, and I think the good news is, and we'll talk a little bit about it now from, with the other speakers, is that we had a strategic planning process that we put in place four years ago. And we developed a strategic plan and adopted it two years ago. And it really addresses a number of issues um, that uh, we face, including uh, our, our branding, including communications, including new programs, and you'll hear all about that this evening. With that, I'll introduce our Vice President of Institutional Advancement, Joe Arthur. Joe? Thank you, Dr. Brosnan, and again, welcome to everybody both in the room and watching us uh, from hopefully across the country. Um, we have a, a lot to cover in the next 20 minutes or so, and we're going to start by just talking a little bit about our brand. We're going to talk about some work that has been done over the last year and a half, what it has led us to, and we're going to show you a quick two-minute uh, brand essence film that's a little bit about what's happening here, and then we're going to get into the academic program and Dr. Hannah and our deans are going to talk more about experiential learning and some of the hallmarks of Del Valle education. Since it's 100 degrees or so, thought I would start with this. <laughs> Everybody likes to put on really heavy clothing and go outdoors and just sweat a little bit, but the reason this is up here, to talk about what, what is a brand. Um, everybody probably knows Gore-Tex and they recognize some of this type of gear that they use. And while this is hard to pronounce, they say that their goal is to manufacture the world's leading polyformers, linings, and laminates. Okay, so what does that mean? That means they want to help you go outdoors and do really cool stuff. This doesn't say that. That does. To bring people closer to nature. So that's just one example. Every company, every school deals with these issues on how to brand, who they are, and what they do. And that's a much better example of how to do it. So let's talk a little bit about us. What does this mean for us? We've done a lot of research. The art and science research, which was done with prospective students who now have completed their junior year here at the college, looked at every aspect of Del Val through the entire process. When they were inquiring, when they were applying, when they had been admitted, whether they decided to matriculate, and looked at the entire scope of our programs and what attracted them to Del Val or what didn't attract them to Del Val. We had a, a tremendous base of research right there. We've done research with our adult students in adult education and graduate education. We've done in-depth interviews with employers, with Del Val's leadership, with students, faculty, staff, alumni, parents, focus groups, brand groups, to really get at the heart of what the issues are about the Del Val experience and what, what, what we are and who we are in the marketplace. And we've got some findings, some of which are discouraging, some of which are encouraging. In the overall global sense, the awareness is actually very low in the, in the entire marketplace. And the brand, for those who are aware, stands for something very narrow. It's, it's not that we're not different. So many schools across the country strive to be different. And they just sort of blend in with each other. They look a lot like the other college. But the good news is that's not us. We are different. And that's something we should be proud of. The issue more for us is relevance. And I know the deans and our academic leaders are going to talk more about the relevance of curriculum, experiential learning, how we get there. Prospective students, many of them didn't see Del Val as a good fit. There were some issues with campus life that we're working on. And, and this is a double-edged sword, that agriculture was the overwhelming reputational attribute. That's a differentiation, which is great. But it was seen by some as too narrow, particularly if they're interested in other disciplines. In the adult student market, we were really a choice of convenience because we offered programs and we were in the area. The good news, or some better news, is that once people did come here at the undergraduate or graduate level, they were happy. They enjoyed working with our faculty, they enjoyed the small personal relationships, the small student-faculty ratio, and the way that they're treated as people in our campus. Employers found hiring our graduates to be very satisfactory. They didn't hire them per se by the Del Val name, if you will, or the brand. But when the students, then alumni, got in, the employers were very satisfied with the work, the work ethic, and a lot of things that grow out of our experiential learning program, which makes sense to us. And that experiential learning program matters to everybody, both inside the campus and outside the campus. There are barriers, I'm not going to go all into this, but our brand was very much seen as being old and dated, not diverse enough. There were different issues, including retention, including the old conversation of ag versus non-ag, which we're getting past 
and we really just that we were reactive and not necessarily as forward thinking, as forward looking as we could have been. That led us to, after all this research, our brand promise. And what we are saying is that we are here to give our students the knowledge and the experience to tackle the most important issues of our time. And I would ask the students who are here, the alumni who are here, the alumni who are watching, to really think about that and absorb that. It doesn't matter whether you came here to study crop science, English literature, business, criminal justice, anything across our curriculum. The idea is that when you're here or when you are here for our alums, and you think about your career and you think about the work that you do day in and day out in society, that the Del Valle's foundation, what it's, what it's supposed to be and what our brand promise is to your students and to the prospective students who will be coming, for some of you who are alums and maybe your children, and eventually your grandchildren, is to really work on these issues to give the knowledge and experience to tackle the most important issues of our time. And I think that is profound when Dean Redding is going to talk later today about the state of agriculture and what that means and what the world's issues are. When you look at the precarious alliance, we're talking about issues of the world's food supply, water, energy, those types of issues. These are the big issues and these are the things that we are prepared to tackle and prepared to work with our students on. I think that this really nails where we are academically and where we want to be. So again, I encourage you to think about that in your own life, in your own studies, in your own career, that that may be a good representation of where Del Valle is and who Del Valle is. Now, if I don't mess this up, I'm going to go see something else. Okay. 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 The message is simple. We grow, they eat. We discover, they mend. We clean, they drink. We innovate, we all thrive. At Delvel, we operate by the Forward Initiative. Those with the know-how to change the world have a responsibility to share it. Since 1896, our very roots have been in roots, making rugged, gnarly inroads into all of life science, business, and a wide view of the world. Roads that take us to the cusp of innovation and wherever the world and its people need us. Here, we turn paper pushing into difference making with inquisitive minds, hands-on experience, and a curriculum of entrepreneurship. Here, we tackle the issues of our time because we are tomorrow's givers, growers, caretakers, trailblazers, peacekeepers, policy makers, and innovators. Changing the world is the business of tomorrow, so we will lead through the next generation of know-how, the science of nurture, and with bountiful ideas about thriving in this world.
And as I said, we're going to talk more about our academic program tonight. And to, to do that, the first person I'd like to introduce is our Vice President for Academic Affairs and Dean of the Faculty, Dr. Bashar Hamm. Okay. Thank you, Joe. Good, good evening, everyone. One of the things that I was uh, asked to speak to tonight is the status change from college to university. And what does that really mean? And how does it impact our students, our alumni, our faculty, our staff, our administration? I'm going to start with the question. Um, does anyone in the room, and cabinet members, you're not allowed to answer this question. Because I've asked this question of them before. Does anyone in the room know the difference between a college and a university in the state of Pennsylvania? Zach? Uh, the ability to give a, PhD, or a doctoral degree? See, I should have said students aren't allowed either. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't plan Zach back there. Um, that's correct. The only difference between a college and a university in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania is the ability to confer doctoral degrees. Nothing about size, nothing about research, nothing about the abandonment of personal teaching, nothing about students not being the priority. The vision that we have for this college, when it becomes a university, is to always be a small teaching-focused institution, regardless of whether it's Delaware Valley College or University Summit. The, the kind of education that the alumni in the room um, where the beneficiaries of is going to be the hallmark that drives us forward. One-on-one uh, one -on -one relationship with our faculty is not going to disappear. In, in, in contrary to that, it's actually being strengthened. Um, Dean Rozlowski in a few minutes will talk a little bit about the recommitment to hands-on experiential learning. Uh, the college is investing lots of resources, including dollars, in making certain that when our students are here at Del Valle, they go through an experiential learning program that is four years in length so that when they graduate, they're ready to hit the ground running regardless of the career path that they choose for themselves. The, the other piece that I would like to speak to is how we are looking to make certain the student experience at Del Valle is not something different than what it's been. Uh, with, with all of our faculty, with all of our chairpersons, the conversation for the past year has focused around one thing. Improved teaching and learning in pursuit of academic excellence. That's really been the driver of just about every conversation within the academic affairs arena on campus, with student affairs, with, alum, with the, uh, the enrollment office. And that conversation is really centered around one constituency, the student. Uh, students come to a college to be better citizens when they leave. And the intent here is to make certain that they not only get a disciplined competency bachelor's degree, but they also leave as responsible citizens who understand the global reality of being a citizen. And that's essentially everything we're trying to do. It's the cornerstone of the strategic plan to make sure that when they leave here, they are ready to solve world problems. Does that happen just because we teach them in the classroom? It's a huge part of it. But without you, the alumni who are in the room and who are out there listening, it won't happen. You're our network. And for us to succeed at experiential learning, for us to succeed at making sure our students get placed in high caliber employment positions and careers, we need every one of you to be part of that network. Um, I'm appealing to you tonight uh, to truly be a part of that network. Without you, it won't happen. The next, I'd, I'd like to phase into why the three undergraduate school or the four school structure that Del Valle is embarking on. Um, as you saw in the video and some of the background research that happened with the brand or leading to the brand analysis, we've been, we have enjoyed one type of reputation for many years, and that is our ag and environmental sciences arena. We are not typically known for the other areas that we do a very good job at educating students in. And what came back from the research is that you need to be something and something, not something or something. Uh, we're not going to be ag or something else. We're going to be ag and environmental sciences and life and physical sciences and business and humanities. So it's not an issue of or, it's an issue of and. 
And we need to make sure that the attention and the name recognition that our ag and environmental sciences have enjoyed over the years continue to enjoy and the students, uh, or you can drive around campus and see the kind of resources that we've committed uh, to ag and environmental sciences. But we need to do the same thing for the other two undergraduate schools and the graduate school so that Delaware Valley College becomes an entity that's spoken in conversations with high school counselors that isn't just an ag school. And that's really incumbent on all of us to make sure that we are very good at being an ag and environmental sciences school, but also very good at the other schools and the other disciplines that our students pursue uh, degrees in. And I'm going to now introduce uh, Dean Ben Rosolowski, or is it Dean Redding? Who's going first? Dean Ben Rosolowski will speak a little bit about the uh, experiential learning program at the college. Thank you for your time. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to thank all of you for coming out tonight, and those of you who are joining us uh, over the internet, welcome as well. It's a real pleasure for me to be able to talk to you tonight about our new experiential learning program. It's something about which we're very excited, and we hope you'll feel energized by it as well. I thought I'd get things started tonight by talking just a little bit about what experiential learning is. Uh, if you get out and Google this, you'll find that there are hundreds of definitions, but the one that we've kind of latched on to is it's really the application for students of what they're learning in the classroom to real-world experiences for which the outcome's not known. And if you think about, those of you who are alumni, if you think about your experiences here at the college, you sense that commitment that we've had for many years to experiential learning, not only through your coursework, but probably through the employment program. And as you know, the employment program required students to complete a certain number of hours uh, in discipline-related work prior to graduation. One of the things that we found, though, is that that experience was not uniformly positive for all students. Some students had better experiences with it than others. We also found in talking to employers that employers wanted, as Dr. Hanna said, uh, students that were not only discipline competent, but who could think on their feet, think critically, uh, communicate well, both orally and in writing, uh, students who could work well with others and work well independently. And we realized that maybe we needed to be doing more to prepare students professionally, not just from a discipline standpoint. Coupled with that, the research from the art and science group, which showed that experiential learning could be a differentiating element for the institution, the cornerstone, if you will, of the academic program moving forward, but only if it evolved from the current employment program. So basically, uh, what we've done is we've revamped our commitment to experiential learning, which is highlighted in the following diagram. I know it looks a little overwhelming at first, but what I want you to see here is a lot of opportunity. Opportunity for our students, opportunity for our faculty, and opportunity for alumni and friends to become more engaged with the college. As you can see in the diagram, with the class of 2016, this fall, we're going to implement this new experiential learning program, which gives students choice between eight different activities that we've developed over the last year and a half. On the left-hand side, you'll see that we are in the process of developing a study abroad program. We've committed to hiring a coordinator for this program who will enable our students to pursue opportunities both in cultural immersion and also full semesters of study abroad. Uh, coupled with that, too, we're also going to be looking to recruit international students uh, as part of that effort, and uh, we think that's going to be a positive experience for, for all involved. Uh, the, best elements of the employment program we've captured through the internship and career exploration experience activities. Um, and I say the best elements. Obviously, many students found it rewarding to go out and seek employment or seek formal internships with outside companies or organizations. But one of the things that we didn't do very well, and we are now very committed to, is not only evaluating the student once they're done with the experience, but preparing them for the activity on the front end and providing them with feedback as they engage in the experience. The acronym that we're using is PAIR. Prepare, participate in the activity, reflect, and then evaluate. And you're going to see that that's present in all of the activities, but the best elements of the employment program are captured in those two. Experiential learning courses, upper right-hand side of the diagram. One of the real positive attributes of this endeavor has been in working with our faculty. Our faculty have not only uh, worked with us to develop these activities, but also to look at their own curriculum 
and determine which courses in the curriculum could be identified as experiential learning courses. We've developed a, a rubric by which courses can be evaluated so that they have the elements that make them true experiential learning courses. Lastly, on the right-hand side, uh, you see student research. The college embarked uh, two years ago on a renewed commitment to faculty student research. And in fact, we've been very fortunate to receive funding from Bristol-Myers Squibb to support that program. Uh, we have presently uh, two dozen students uh, this fall who will be engaged in student research projects with our faculty. And students will be able to now utilize that experience as part of the experiential learning program. And as you can see, all of those activities across the top say credit bearing. Another strength of this program is the partnership that's occurred between academic affairs and student affairs in providing the three activities that you see at the bottom of the diagram. Leadership development, civic engagement, and community service. We're recognizing that it's important not only to prepare students for what goes on in the classroom and the discipline, but also to prepare them to be good citizens. And I think Dr. Hanna spoke to that a few minutes ago. So these eight activities are going to be the, uh, the main activities of our program. Students will be introduced to these during their first year on campus by way of a one credit course uh, entitled, appropriately, Introduction to Experiential Learning. Students will learn at that time about the major requirements for their respective curriculum. Each department is going to decide which two activities are the minimum requirements. But what makes that course special is that students are going to develop, as part of it, an experiential learning plan that's going to be a living document that goes beyond the minimum and charts out what they're going to be doing with respect to experiential learning over their four years here. Obviously, that will be modified, it will evolve, it will involve conversations with their advisor, their department chair, uh, staff in our office, but it gets students in that mindset that they're here at the institution not just to learn about their discipline, but to take what they're learning and apply it to real-world situations. Um, we believe that this new program uh, is a key part of this brand promise. You just saw it introduced by Joe Eckert. Uh, the knowledge and experience to tackle the most important issues of our time. We think this program is going to help us to fulfill that promise to our students, but more importantly, give them a competitive edge over their peers at other institutions so that when they go out and they apply for jobs, they look to go to graduate school or professional school, Del Val is going to be at the top of the chart for these students and for these uh, employers in these graduate schools, and our students will have a distinct advantage over students from other institutions. During the Q&A session, I'll be happy to, uh, to address any, any comments you have. Please keep in mind what Dr. Hanna said, though. We need you to be partners in this endeavor because a big piece of this plan involves networking with the community. And uh, we'll be calling on some of you uh, to, uh, to assist us in identifying opportunities for students. And uh, we encourage you also to reach out to us. So with that, we're going to turn to the next part of the program, and it's a pleasure for me to introduce my colleague and friend, uh, Dean Russell Redding, who's going to talk to you about the uh, state of agriculture at the college. Russell? And thank you. Uh, great job. Uh, it really is uh, uh, one of these topics where we, we talk about it all the time, but uh, it really is nice to hear Ben speak of it and put the pieces together and use this historical perspective of what was with what needs to be to uh, to help paint the picture and lead us uh, in the future. So thank you, uh, Ben. Uh, good evening. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Honored to be at the college. Um, great to be uh, back at Del Val. Some of you uh, know sort of the history a little bit, but they had a chance uh, some years ago to, to uh, talk to Dr. Brosnan uh, about the future and, and stepped away and I came back. Uh, and I often reflect on that moment because it was an important moment. It was one where I had a chance early on to see uh, what was happening in terms of a new president, a new team, uh, a new vision for the college. I stepped away. I come back uh, two years or so later. And everything uh, that had been talked about in my initial meetings, where we were, it was termed, we need to do that, we hope to do that, we should do that, uh, I came back. Uh, and it was in present day terms. We are. It is. We can show you the strategic plan. Uh, that was a defining moment for me. It was no longer whether this college was committed to uh, being a world-class educational institution. They had a plan. That was important. That brought me back. 
and you couple uh, that leadership with the phenomenal history of this college, 116 years, and you look at the characteristics of this college, the land base, the talent, the legitimacy on the issues to tackle the most important uh, issues of our time. You look at the faculty. There are so many assets here. And they are unique to Delaware Valley College. We are in a very special class. So to have a chance to work with the team, some of which you've seen tonight, many others, uh, to help shape this future is really a high honor. Uh, we have uh, provided, I think, through, through email to the uh, alumni and to students uh, updates uh, through the spring, so you have a lot of the background. And I'll spare some of those details, but I want to just draw your attention to a few. Uh, I can summarize this uh, in, in very easily with what I call sort of the three P's. It's progress, it's planning, and it's a promise. On the progress side, this is built on strategic planning. This is built on the gift of the guns. This is built on the good work and the good thinking of those who have come before us. It's built on the good work of the Ag uh, Task Force that looked at the college, the Ag Environmental Sciences, and made a number of recommendations, and I had the, the, uh, the privilege of picking it up and continuing to work on it. But it's built on that premise. We look at the progress, and hopefully, as Dr. Brosnan uh, noted in, in the introduction, uh, you've had a chance to sort of make your own assessment, you know, driving through the campus and around the campus. It is a very strong statement of what we value. Right? You can step outside and know that we're in the business of growing things. We have pride about what it is that we own. We have unique pieces here that only we can talk about with any degree of legitimacy. But you see that uh, in the orchard, you see that at the dairy, you see that in the general landscaping, and much of that credit goes to Pat Callahan, uh, who happens to be a 1999 grad of Del Bell as well. I think that uh, is a bonus for us. Uh, clearly, he, he knows uh, the college, but he worked in, in the commercial sector and brought all of those skills uh, back here. But you've had a chance to, to make your own assessment. Uh, a couple of highlights. If you're going to be in the business of talking about contemporary issues, then you need to talk about it in contemporary terms. You need to show contemporary practices. Uh, we made a decision uh, when we came on to, to take the old orchards out. Very difficult decisions. And there's two, two issues that I've dealt with here that have gotten me more emails uh, than anything else. One was taking out the orchard. The other was shrinking the dairy herd. But I would say that part of teaching is making those tough decisions. Right? It's part of what we have to do. But if you look at it today, we've got a new uh, high-density orchard that we put in so we can talk about, we can teach, we can show the students uh, three different production systems, three different uh, rootstocks, and all of those things that go with being a productive, uh, a productive, a productive um, a producer, uh, contemporary producer. Um, we've made leadership changes. I think it's important who leads things is a statement. Uh, we have new leadership in animal sciences. We restructured the animal sciences to bring those uh, complementary pieces together and take, quite frankly, advantage of uh, a 19 year faculty member here at the college who has a doctor of veterinary medicine and a PhD in animal sciences. It sounds like somebody who should lead the discussions about animal science. Uh, Dr. Pam Reed has done a great job uh, doing that. We have uh, Dr. Bruce Richards uh, here tonight. Uh, Bruce, you joined the faculty. We'd still put you in the new faculty column. Uh, you, you've had the first full year, but welcome to Dr. Richards in the dairy science department. Another great example of a new addition, new thinking about the future of animal sciences. Uh, we've made some changes in the natural resources and biosystems management uh, department. Co-chairs, uh, a, a more a senior faculty member, uh, Dr. Steve DeBrew, here 18, 19 years now, full professor. Uh, Steve is the plant science. Uh, Michael Fleeshacker, a relatively new faculty member, uh, brings the environmental sciences, but you have this very nice complement of perspective of the department and skills of industry and of academia. Uh, we also have the new member uh, leading our arboretum, uh, Dr. John Martin, uh, who happened to be the very first arboretum director uh, some years ago. Some of you know John and maybe uh, even had Dr. Martin in class. That's just a sampling of some of the leadership changes. Um, progress on the farm management team. 
if you've got a thousand acres, uh, then how you manage that is an important statement. And we are fortunate to have it, but it takes a whole different skill set. Uh, we're fortunate with the Gemmel gift to get a beautiful farm and real estate and, and uh, a lot of uh, uh, you know, facilities that we appreciate. But uh, one of the real treasures in that gift was the talent that came with it. Uh, to have Dr. Uh, Doug Christie, uh, his 1967 grant of uh, Del Val and Port Culture, uh, as the farm manager there for 40 plus years, he stepped into a new role in the college as uh, our farm management uh, uh, director overseeing the thousand acres. With him, uh, Scott Smith, uh, worked at none such farms here in Bucks County. Uh, he's the assistant farm manager, but it's a very different, very, very different team. Uh, the stewardship, I, I mentioned, the director of grants and landscaping is noted. Uh, the reinvestments over the last year, we put a, you know, half a million dollars in projects. That's people and, and resources all the way around. So a lot of, a lot of progress. On the planning front, uh, you know, we continue to work with the faculty, as Dr. Hanna mentioned, uh, on looking at our academic programs. How do you improve the teaching and learning? At the end of the day, that's what it's about. We're in one business. As much as I like to talk about dairy herds and, and the orchards, uh, the only product we produce is a marketable education. That's what it's about. So it's got to be focused on, on the uh, teaching and learning. We're working with the faculty to look at the courses, look at the majors, look at the content, uh, and that is a work in progress. Uh, the experiential learning has, has been noted that's part of the planning process, but how do you do that? I mean, how do you really do that uh, so it's a, a, a common experience across the college for every one of our students? We know that we've got some long-term needs in terms of facilities and faculty and resources. That's part of the planning that's underway as we speak. And how do we leverage uh, the assets we have, both in terms of the human assets, the financial, and the uh, natural resources? One of those uh, projects particularly has been the Roth Farm. You know, we passed the 20-year anniversary in November uh, of, again, a major gift to the college, and it came with certain covenants. So we put an additional covenant on it to, to protect the land uh, forever. Having been the Secretary of Agriculture and have signed many of those uh, uh, deeds, I've read that language and have been challenged on that language. Uh, and if you read the contract, it says that you will use those properties in perpetuity for a productive agricultural use. Ask one time to define the word perpetuity. I have my own word, my own definition. It is forever in one day. You cannot get out of that. That is a legal requirement that we have now put on uh, the Roth farm. So what do you do with it? One of the real benefits at this college with the thousand acres and the Gemmel gift, I think, has made this possible. You take the main campus grounds, which are sort of mixed use when you look at the farm. It's got everything, it has to accommodate all the livestock enterprises, all horticulture, all the, uh, the green industry. What we have now is the opportunity to take the main campus, and that'll be mixed use as it needs to be for purposes of education. But we have a Gemmel uh, gift that is more in the conventional type of agriculture. It's got some very progressive orchards on it, but it's more in the conventional side. What we can show is the other end of that spectrum at the Roth Farm around sustainable agriculture. And when you look at that, very few institutions can show you that full spectrum of production. That is unique. So we have set forth a plan to, uh, in just the last couple of weeks, to, to use the Roth farm as the Roth Center for Sustainable Agriculture. The Roth Center for Sustainable Agriculture. And that will give us a chance to experiment with sustainable agricultural practices. Um, could be organic in some cases, but it is more of a sustainable model of production. Uh, on the livestock side, on uh, the, the plant side. The key to that was having our faculty initiate a specialization in uh, sustainable agricultural systems. And that will be offered beginning this fall. That's the premise. That's the reason we have the assets. It's the reason that we exist. So the faculty have now uh, put that forward. Uh, we think it has phenomenal appeal. You cannot be in the conversations about the big issues of our time without talking about the range of production and environmental issues that come from sustainable, conventional, and genetically modified. 
I spent half my life trying to figure out the coexistence between those. And we have it here on this campus. But we can show that. So uh, that is a great gift uh, for us. I mentioned the faculty in the planning stage. We've got several searches underway uh, for a uh, faculty member in the uh, uh, ABC department as well as one in animal science. The promise. Probably the easiest thing to do. I say it's easy. If you look at the history of this college, if you look at the strategic plan, if you look at the assets, if you look at the very deep commitment and experiences of both the faculty we have here and the students, and many of you are in that class, we need to deliver on the promise of remarkable education. Remarkable education. That means you're out in the street then. And with the assets we have here, we can add tremendous value to that. And to the point earlier, uh, it is about AMP. It's not about war. You can't be in the discussions uh, and lead the conversations, by the way, of agriculture and environmental science in the future without understanding what happens in biology, what happens in chemistry, in psychology, in English, in math. The folks who do that well will lead the conversations about the future. That's what we're doing. That's what we're working every day to do. And that is our promise. Thank you. Uh, yeah, a privilege to uh, introduce. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well rehearsed. <laughs> I had the uh, privilege of uh, working with uh, the students this year. It's been one of the real benefits of, of coming to campus is having the uh, chance to work with students. Great students, many great students uh, here tonight. Uh, one of them being uh, Zach Orski. Uh, Zach, uh, Zach is going to share a student's perspective for a few minutes. Uh, I had a chance to, to work with Zach. Um, a couple of times throughout the year, but really started last year in planning for a hunger summit uh, that was being uh, hosted here at the college in partnership with Bucks County Opportunity Council. Uh, and Zach took an interest out of that uh, experience uh, to do a lot of things. Uh, one was to help uh, with the garden, which I'm sure uh, he'll mention. Uh, but he had a, uh, really a, a great experience to, to go to Kansas City, and maybe you want to tell him a little bit about this. but. Uh, we had a chance this year to participate in the first time Delaware Valley College has done it in the National Spokesperson's Contest in Agriculture. First time we've ever done it. Uh, Zach goes. Uh, I get a call about two days after he's there and, and uh, from one of the other folks uh, at an unnamed institution here in the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, <laughs> he said, uh, hey, tell me more about this Zach. Uh, he's really good. I said, listen, uh, we didn't buy the plane ticket and send him to Kansas City. Uh, to take second place. Uh, you, you finished the story. <laughs> oh, well, um, he's my mentor, so everything I've done has been a great deal because of him, so I have to thank him personally. Um, I'm a little bit of an old body. Actually, I started here in 2006, so I was here before the cabinet. So um, I've been able to see, yeah. Just, actually, John Brown's a little bit reminds me of that. Makes him feel good. Um, I've been blessed to see all the changes. And um, I always tell people when we talk about the change at Del Val to a very special moment that I had with uh, Mr. Gilbert. I know a lot of alum alumni will know Mr. Gilbert. Um, in 2007, when President Brosnan came here, I remember sitting in his trailer and talking to him about what's going to happen next. Because we were just nervous. We just didn't know. And um, it's been super exciting. You know, for 116 years, Del Val has been a beacon of light for the agricultural world, and it's never shined bright. Um, everything he said he was going to do is done, and I think that's just a wonderful thing. And you know, it's touched my life. Um, I, I said the scholarship there not too long ago. Del Val had been my home, but it's become family. Um, I you know I don't know all the cabinet members extremely well, but I do know a lot of them, and I think they all have their great niche. Dr. Ben's always about authenticity. Is it is it authentic? Is it Del Val? Norm's always about is it is it the message we want to send? Is it is it the Del Val brand that we we keep promising people? John's always about how does it affect our students? You know, Dean Redding is if we say something, you know, do we deliver on our promise? And Dr. Hannah is always about quality and uh, presence about all of it. I think it's it's one of those wonderful things. Um, I've had a crazy year. You know, I I won this national you know ag spokesman award. You know, he calls me Zach. You need to go. I get on a plane in a blizzard. 
you know, Kansas City, it's nuts. You know, I don't know anybody. I've never met anybody before. You know, and you know, I, I'm doing this competition, and I write about this terrible garden project that we're working on, and you know, I beat kids from Penn State, Cornell. I mean, it was it was awesome. And uh, I came back, and then we had the hunger summit, and we spoke at at the Bucks County Opportunity Council, and, and all these people, and said, you know, for 116 years, Del Val has taught students how to feed the world, but now we're going to feed our community. And we've been doing it. You know, we've got 200 or uh, 2,000 PB&J sandwiches out to all the community, and uh, we're, we've got an acre of ground that's producing uh, melons, corn, cucumbers, tomatoes that's going to feed families in our, in our county. And we talked about the raw farm, and you know, we're working on a proposal for the raw farm to do some more charitable work. Um, you know, I was blessed to win, you know, with one other wonderful student to win Founders Award. Um, it's never been a more exciting time. Uh, I just spent two weeks in Poland. And uh, just to give a little bit more credibility to what Dr. Hannes says, you know, the college university debate. In a foreign country, college is high school event. So a lot of them couldn't understand, you know, when I say I went to Delaware Valley College, because they go to the University of Alaska, you know, to them there's a big difference. And uh, it made it relevant. It made it to me, you know, and relevancy is something we always talk about here. The students are always relevant and our brands are always relevant. Um, in a few, uh, few weeks, I'll be going to the National Republican Convention through the Washington Center, which is one of the new experiential learning programs we're working with, me and one other student. Something nobody other at Del Valle has ever done before. This program is designed for graduate students. Two undergraduate students are going. Um, in December, I'll be going back to Memphis, Tennessee to co coordinate the Ag Spokesman competition with the Young Farmers Institute that I won last year. And, you know, it's just one of those wonderful, exciting times with Del Valle. And I would tell you as you know, alumni, you know, it's one of, those, one of those times you want to get involved. If you haven't come back to Del Valle, come back. Because it will, it, it will make you happier than you can ever imagine. I, I, I'm a ambassador. I, I give a lot of tours to alumni and their children. You know, a lot of old questions. And um, it, it, it really is a great time. So that's, that's really all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Zach. Uh, one of the focal points of advancement is to find future alumni leaders, future alumni associations, executive, executive committee members and presidents, and future trustees. Okay, Zach? <laughs> this is the part of the program that we really want to open it up to everyone who is here. So what I will ask, I will try to serve as a facilitator for the question and answers, and I would ask my fellow cabinet members, uh, if you're responding to questions to come up here to join us, just as we have the microphone set up, that'll make it easiest, particularly for the folks watching us through live stream. Um, for questions from the audience, if you could just stand and give us your name, class year, and major, and then talk about your question. Uh, and then I'll try to restate the question so folks, again, for the live stream can hear it because the way the microphones are set up, that'll be a little bit easier for them. And then we'll uh, get a group of people to help answer. So this is an open forum for you to bring up your thoughts. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Mark McDevitt. Uh, my major is sport culture. Uh, going through your presentation, the experiential learning process seems like a very important thing, even to current students. I was just curious, would it be something that we can, I guess, initiate into current students and, and getting them the opportunity as well? Sure, I'll. Okay, did that pick up the question from them? Great question. Phenomenal question. I wish I could stand up here and tell you that we could launch it for every student on campus. Uh, we are being very deliberative, very reflective, and piloting it with the incoming freshman class so that as we roll it out, the mistakes we make we can fix in a controllable size um, pilot. I will say to the current students though, those of you that are interested in doing part of the experiential learning program that you saw here, we commit to you being able to do it on a case by case with you to students. So that we're not saying no, but I can't stand up here and honestly tell you we could roll this out to the entire student body uh, simultaneously. It just would be a Herculean effort that will not lead to great success. Uh, but having said that, I think it's important for the students who are here to realize that 
we're committed to making your experiential learning experience on campus as successful as we can. So if you have ideas or if you want to participate in, in activities that are technically geared towards the freshman class and beyond, um, we'd be more than happy to have the folks in the experiential learning office sit down and talk with you about what might be possible. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. First one is uh, when you're uh, in your branding presentation, uh, you indicated a number of uh, items that were uh, identified as, if you will, problem areas. Uh, are we, in fact, uh, doing something to address those particular issues? That's my first question. Second question I have, and <clears throat> probably I, I think it yeah, might even be a little bit more important than that one, is. What is the college doing to interact with all the industry that we have in this Delaware Valley area to, to get our students involved with those companies and uh, even from the standpoint of experiential uh, training or uh, getting involved in doing projects like the Bristol Myers Squibb project uh, with other, other companies uh, in the area? Thank you. Oh, Joe Striese, place is 73, I'm sorry. That's okay, thanks Joe. Another member of our Alumni Association Executive Committee, thanks for being here. And, and I'll invite others to add, to add to this, but Joe, what I'd say to, to your first question in terms of addressing some of those brand issues, I think really if you look at the strategic plan and something Dr. Rosen has said for years, the idea, and, and Dean Redding talked about this today, the idea of having that strength in agriculture is, is a foundation for us for 116 years. And the, the cornerstone of the plan is to take that strength and to increase it by doing the things that Russell was talking about. And then to take every other area, so the other two undergraduate schools and the graduate school, and bring those up, elevate those to the level where agriculture and environmental science has been for a long time. Because that more, more of a diverse brand awareness is what we had been lacking and what we're looking for to get that across all spectra in every academic discipline. In terms of the second one, I think it's multifaceted in terms of our relationships with outside organizations, experiential learning. I think Ben wants to say something to this too. One component I'd say is that this is an area and a focus of our strategic planning task force on alumni engagement and how alumni, and many of you in the room are already a part of that solution, but how alumni in a broader sense can help us in providing some of those experiences that Ben talked about for our students in your uh, corporate lives and what you've done since you've left DelVal. It's a focus on our corporate and foundation relations area, which is where the relationships with places like Bristol Myers Squibb have evolved, and it's a focus on our alumni life as well, and I think Ben has some additional thoughts on that. Thanks, Joe. That's an excellent question, and in fact, it's a key part of the experiential learning program. One of the things that we found when we looked at the employment program and our history with it, we probably haven't done as good a job as we could reaching out to employers and community partners across all disciplines. So part of the, the plan that we have, the experiential learning program is housed in the same area as career services. We're working on a plan now with career services to develop outreach activities for different disciplines. Primarily, we've reached out through, uh, as many of you know, employment fairs or career fairs that have occurred in the fall and spring semesters. We're going to begin to target disciplines. We're going to do personalized outreach to particular disciplines and engage community partners. We also need to work better with the faculty in terms of their individual contacts. As you can imagine, some faculty uh, and staff are better connected than others with industry leaders in the area, but that Outreach is a key part of the uh, strategic plan, both for experiential learning and also for career services. It's going to take some time to get to where we need to be, but we recognize that as a, a shortcoming as we went through this process in the last year and a half. So stay tuned and we'll report back to you. And again, as I indicated earlier, we'll also be reaching out to you to begin to build some of those uh, partnerships. Thank you. Alan Wrights, I'm a small business owner at the Pennsylvania Biotechnology Center, which is half owned by Del Val. So 
So my question is, I mean, that's certainly an area where one can try to branch out to try to get involvement of students and in, in internships and the like. My question is, so what is the academic discipline that might be the subject for the PhD degree as the school goes into university status? It's probably going to be an EDD, not a PhD, and it'll probably be in, in, in an arena within education uh, because one of the things that we, again, the research that we've been able to do with the Arts and Science Group, it's an area where we can make um, high impact, especially if we have an EDD that is taught by uh, terminally credentialed practitioners and we focus on the practitional piece of the EDD, not just the theory, which also speaks to our legacy of uh, learning by doing and experiential learning and hands-on. And that fits best with where are, we are going as an institution. What's an EDD? A Doctorate of Education. Hi, Alan. Hi. Well, good to see you. I haven't seen you in a while. Uh, so what's your thinking? Yes. In terms of a PhD, I mean, if you think about it in terms of the, the pharma industry, the biotech industry, I know that you're very involved with, what would you think would be a need out there that out of master's or doctor level. Well, I haven't thought of this the way that you guys have. So, um, so obviously there's a core competency in education and outreach to the, to the university. But I mean, you do have the, the ag, you could build on that to get a PhD in that field. I mean, certainly this area is a hotbed of biotech and bio research. So it's also green entrepreneurship or sort of, you know, developing new technologies for agricultural uh, applications such as use of, you know, biofuels and, and the like. So, I would think some sort of, uh, I mean, I don't, again, I don't mean to speak out of term, but maybe a harder physical science type PhD in the area of real strength of the university to, to the college. That's just, just off the top of my head. Off the cuff, you know. Thanks, I, I haven't thought of it the way you guys have. Before our next question, I just wanted to say hello and welcome Don Richardson. Don, who served on the board for many years. Welcome. Thank you. exactly why we're moving in that direction. So students who embark on a bachelor's degree at Delaware Valley College will understand and appreciate why they have to take two courses in English while they're a chemistry major or a biology major. Uh, if you can't communicate effectively, both verbally and in a written word, your class ceiling is pretty low. You're already at it. Uh, we've, we hear it all the time. I, I'm, I'm ABC major. Why do I have to take two courses in English? Um, so I think it's, it's making them realize that even the first course that uh, Dean Rozulowski alluded to, the Intro to Experiential Learning, uh, part of that course has them writing cover letters, thank you notes to people who interviewed them, uh, the entire gamut of what we refer to as the soft skills that I think this generation of students, and it's not an indictment, have lost touch with, where it's everything's text or email and we forget about capitalization and punctuation. Uh, it's just an accepted art these days for them. I think it's, it's taking them back to a point where an employer expects this of you, and as a working professional, you need to step up. That's the exact hallmark and, and the premise behind the experiential learning program. Great question. Thank you. 
we'll pick up that side. Yeah. 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 for the class of 74. Um, spent a few hours in this room. But uh, anyway, uh, in fact, I just got an email from my roommate from college. So this is the anniversary of our 40th year swim in Lake Archer. I had to think about that for the night. That's all I'm going to say about that tonight. But anyhow. Uh, we have a slide on that. I'm sure you do. You don't want to show it. <laughs> At any rate, uh, we learned it late. that's what an acre is, is Lake Archer. You want to know what an acre of land is? Look at Lake Archer. It's an acre, right? So uh, at any rate, uh, one question up at our last alumni executive meeting was, how do you make the connection as industry to get into the, in other words, is there, what's the, is there through the internet, or how do we make the connection to, to be able to help out with this new program if we want to be involved? That's being launched. Does that make okay. sense? Yeah. Go ahead. The, the, Sorry, I'm going yeah, to take this one so I'm watching. I'm getting my exercise. <laughs> Great question. And, and it's going to be a website that the experiential lear learning program at the college will be launched in mid-September. And one of the attributes of that website is for community partners to register their company or themselves in order to make contact with us by just leaving a name and a number and a contact information. And then the folks in experiential learning will reach out to to everybody that signs up through that website, which will be launched around the time the freshmen arrive to campus. Hi, Dean Acuna, class of 74. Uh, just a recommendation on this. Uh, depending on how alumni to come up with uh, the only connection. Uh, I know it takes an effort, it takes time and so forth. But I was in a local business. If the college also would go to the industries that are in the area, knock on doors, talk to HR, they have their own programs and don't know a contact at Del Val. So my only recommendation is to make sure that we do the one that has Del Val going out to the That's a good point, Ben. Do you want to Yeah, agree. Yeah, that ties into uh, what we were just talking about a moment ago, and that's developing that relationship base. And that's that's going to be part of our plan in moving forward. It's not just in, in assessing what contacts we have and reaching out discipline place in a discipline-based way, but also reaching out to the community. So that, again, stay tuned. That's going to be something that will be coming. I also wanted the opportunity to uh, address uh, the issue. And I'm sorry, I don't recall your name sitting next to the gentleman. Joanne, Joanne, you raised the issue, and I know Bashar addressed it about uh, you know this differentiator and about the experience that students get. One of the things I neglected to say as part of my presentation was when our students finish now under the new experiential learning program, they're not only going to have their traditional academic transcript, they're also going to have a co-curricular transcript that's going to highlight all of these activities, both those that are required and those that the student has participated in as part of his or her personalized experiential learning plan. So again, it's something that a student comes out with, we talked about being marketable and you know, hitting the ground running. Students can have both those documents in, in their hands. And again, we think that's going to be a differentiator moving forward. Thank you. Can I just speak to that question as well? Because uh, I, I meant to comment earlier. And that is that um, the federal government is, is really going to require us to report uh, people in, in terms of how many students are getting uh, jobs after the graduation. Uh, we are collecting data and have been, you know, historically we have as well, but we are really making a very concerted effort to collect all the data about our students as they graduate. And that information is going to become part of the website. So we're really going to be emphasizing, because we think that's a real asset of us. Uh, Del Valle is a place where this year we had an awful lot of students who got excellent jobs leaving the institution based on all the other major they were in, uh, whether, what internship they, were, they had. All of those things led to, I think, a, a very strong placement here in Arlington, as well as a lot of people going to graduate school for, for, for uh, in the sciences and veterinary medicine and all of that. So clearly, it's, it's advantage us, for us to make a big point about that. So thanks for your question. Being that I'm graduating in December, I want to ask that really hard question. What are the numbers? You know, and where do we go for the numbers? Um, before you came here, I know when I came to Del Valle, they said we had a 97% employment rate when you graduated. And you know, I think we all kind of knew at the time that wasn't exactly you know, 
kids will work at Starbucks, kids will work at McDonald's with degrees, you know. The numbers are the numbers. You know, what, as a graduate, what fields are people getting jobs in? How much are they making? You know, I'm gonna walk out of here with fifty, sixty thousand dollars worth of debt. You know, I need to make thirty-eight, forty thousand dollars a year to be able to make my loan payments. You know, what are my chances of doing that? What what areas are we doing a great job of getting jobs in? And what areas do you need to send me to an alumni's door so I can get a job in? I mean, you know, I'm willing to do the legwork too, but honestly, I think it's one of the, the best kept secrets at the school. And I don't know if it's just because we're trying to get the numbers out to people, but you know, be honest with us. Tell tell us you know what areas we're doing really good in, and what areas are we not doing good in? How many kids do we send to grad school every year? What you know, where are they going? And you just give us the numbers and let us do let us help. You know, I, I, that's just something I've never asked, and I, you know, I've always been kind of curious. You know, what is the outlook for us? You know, I read the papers every single day. I know tuitions are going up, and I know recession is not going away anytime soon. I know I'm competing with somebody who's been working for 15 years who has got no student debt anymore. I understand that. I'm not, I'm not shy. I'm not scared of it. I just, I just want to know what I need to know so I can go out there and make the best decisions possible. You know, how can you help me with that? Excellent question, uh, Zach. I'm going to ask Dr. Stay out there. And before he does, I just want to add one thing, Zach, and, and especially for alumni in the room. One of the things that we found, which was an information gap on our side, and it's our fault, not the fault of the alumni, is that we didn't feel that we had enough accurate data on where our alumni are. Uh, there's a lot of alumni leaders in the room, and we certainly know where you are because you're a part of the, of the college's life every day. But the last time a, a comprehensive alumni survey was done, talking about where you are in your career and what you're doing, and relationship to the college today, the last time that had been done was in 1996. Now that's not the type of thing you do annually, but it's not the type of thing you do every 16 years either. So we did one in this last year, and we got more than 2,500 responses. And they were from all over the country and all over the world, and from an incredible strata of class years. So the reason that's relevant to your question is it helps us to know on the employment side who's working where, and we did ask questions about willingness to volunteer, help with mentoring, help with internships, with the idea of feeding into the exact the experiential learning model that you heard about. So we now have more data going forward, but that's only one, one side of it. Thanks for the question, Zach. <laughs> um, great question, very timely question. Uh, I can't speak to the, num to the amount of student loans uh, students graduate with. That, that just isn't a number I have. But I will tell you, of those that responded to the surveys we conducted last year, approximately 85% of them were employed. And I can't stand up here and tell you whether it's employment in their field or not. That's something that we, I think we, we absolutely clearly need to dig into a little more. Uh, the, the problem you encounter when you send out surveys to graduates is the return rate is almost zero. And I say that to the alumni who are in the room, especially the young alumni, because the Career Services Office now, uh, for the first year after graduation, is attempting to reach out to you every 30 days in order to get the data from you. So please respond to them for two reasons. President Brosnan hit on the, the, the main reason. The federal government now is asking us to report on gainful employment in our programs. They haven't told us yet that you need to have X percent employed by X or Y months of graduation in order to continue to be in, in order to continue to allocate uh, federal student aid to those majors. But I would bet, given the economy and the state of the federal government's coffers, that's probably not long down the road. So that's the really the major reason. If you want the students who are earning a degree in your major that are walking in the steps you walked in a few years ago, please respond to those inquiries. It's not to harass you and next month come and say, give us a check. Joe might come and say, give us a check, but the Career Services Office won't say, give us a check. Um, and, this, and the second reason why it's important, because the alumni themselves, especially the young alumni, who are going out there and experiencing both a good time and, un and God forbid, Less than a good time. One, the Career Services Office can be a resource for you because they do have lists of employment opportunities that they can share with you. But those of you that are having a good time out there, we would love to hear what about the education or the experiential learning that occurred here helped you. 
And those of you that are not having, God forbid, a, a, you know, a great time, what was it that we could have done differently together to write a different story? And I think those are the kinds of questions the, the Career Services Office is trying to get answers to from you. Without that input from you, we really will be at a loss. But the first reason is the one Dr. Grosman mentioned. The federal government is, at, we're, we're under attack. Not just we as Delaware Valley College, all of higher ed, for profit, not for profit, public, private, is under attack from the federal government for lots of good and bad reasons, but we're under attack nonetheless. Does that answer your question, Zach? And the data, by the way, I'm sorry, the data is available on the Career and Life Education website. Zach, I'm not worried about you getting a job. <laughs> but after that question, I would be if I were you. Any questions from our current students? Or comments, yeah, from the reactions, feedback, you, what your experience is here. Uh, Emily Kagan, uh, class of 2001. Uh, you had mentioned about how we can be involved in the experiential learning as alumni. Uh, how else can the alumni be involved uh, with that lab? Great question, Emily. Thank you. Um, there are a number of ways. I think when we look at the what I would call the, the life cycle of a student at college, if you think about the beginning of that life cycle, it's really the admissions and enrollment management process. So we have alumni who already help, help in this area, and, and Norm and his team in enrollment management are working to both strengthen and expand our geographic reach. Um, I think most of you know that we draw our students currently primarily from an eight state radius with Pennsylvania being number one and New Jersey being number two. We want to strengthen those markets, there's nothing wrong with that, but we also want to expand. Uh, Norm's team has spent a lot of time this year in outer regions of Maryland and, and Virginia to try and expand in those territories. And as we go forward, we have ambitions to, to expand from there. So I think alumni can work with admissions through our office, I'm not sending you somewhere else, through the alumni office, to partner with them where there are gaps in our needs for recruiting students in particular territories. That I see is sort of the input part of the process, if you will. And then throughout the student's experience here, I think the experiential learning model and the types of things that Ben was talking about are very valuable. And on the, on the output side of it, the outgrowth of that obviously is in the employment and mentoring phase. I think if you work in a company where you can hire a Del Val graduate, that's wonderful but you may not, but you may work in an industry where your expertise and your experience, your knowledge can help to benefit a student who's going through what you went through when you were coming out. So I think that, that mentoring, coaching can be very helpful in addition to potentially providing employment opportunities. Um, the, the opportunities really are endless, especially as we go forward and diversify, but I think those are ways that you can really make a difference for our students. The other thing I would add um, is that So, but you can hear me. Um, the other thing I would add, Emily, is that uh, given the, uh, I just want to make sure people on the last uh, I would add that uh, in response to Emily's question, that uh, the purpose of tonight was to let everybody know what was happening in the institution. There's a lot of change going on. It's created anxiety, some, some concerns, some misinformation, whatever. I think you folks, as alums, as, as trustees, as, as folks who are hearing this story tonight, I think it would be really important for, us, for you to act as ambassadors on our behalf. <coughs> so the alumni in the room, the students in the room, can get the information out to folks in a way and respond to questions about uh, what's going on with agriculture, what's going on, what does this university status mean? Is it I mean we're going to suddenly become impersonal, we're going to become school of 10,000. No, we're, as, as, as Dr. Hanna said, we're going to be a small teaching university. And that means that it's not a major change in the nature of the institution. It's a change in our status that allows us to do more things, like offer uh, doctoral programs. 
And that's what we're doing here, not changing the nature of the institution. We're building on the history of the institution and the strengths of the institution, as, as uh, uh, Dean Redding said. So I think that is really an important thing that can go forward, because right now there's a lot of concern and anxiety out there in, in, the, uh, in the alumni uh, world. I just wanted to add something there, Emily, that's a great question. And one of the things that came to us immediately as we were talking among ourselves in, in the audience was uh, coming into guest lecture. Uh, many of you have talents, expertise that can only add to the student's experience here. And that can be in a formalized setting, like a classroom or a laboratory, but it can also be an, an evening arrangement with uh, some student uh, clubs or organizations uh, participating. And also with respect to experiential learning, and rightfully so, a lot of the questions are about employment and internship. But remember, too, that we're looking to get our students engaged in other activities like student research. And Dr. Wrights mentioned the, the Biotech Center. Uh, the deans and Dr. Hanna have been involved in discussions up there and developing some formalized internships uh, with the staff at the Biotech Center. We're also looking at getting students involved in uh, civic engagement, uh, uh, service learning. So please, come forward with any ideas, any connections you have. There are plenty of ways to be involved. Thank you. By the way, I just take this moment to announce something that we're working on and, uh, in regard to a couple of questions that were asked. We're working with former Congressman Jim Greenwood, who's the head of the National Bio Association. Uh, to, uh, he's going to put us in contact with um, a lot of the HR directors and both large and small pharma and the biotech industry. So he's a very influential person. He's a big supporter of, uh, of Del Val and he's willing to step forward and help us in that regard. It's a, big, it's a big step, and we're really pleased he's been going to do that. It speaks to your question as well, Joe, I think. Other questions, comments, thoughts? Sometimes Dr. Brosnan asks, any rumors? Right. Yeah, I don't ask that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Tom, you remember that when I did that with I haven't it. heard any lately. <laughs> you haven't started any lately. No. <laughs> I did that one day, and Dr. Johnson, Ron Johnson, uh, it was one of my first times I did a state of the college, and I said, nobody asked any questions, so I said, any rumors? He says, is it true you're $400,000 in the hole? I had just found out that morning that we were $400,000 short on the budget. He knew before I did. <laughs> and he asked that question. So I said, no, that's not a rumor, it's true, and I'm going to take care of it. <laughs> to clarify, that was five oh, years ago. I never asked that question. <laughs> you might want to, you might find things out. <laughs> we will still take questions and comments, and the President may have some closing remarks, but I also wanted to just echo something he said before, and I want to thank Jackie Gear, our Director of Alumni Relations, for making this happen tonight. And I want to thank Dan Greb, who's our web manager, the man behind the camera over here, uh, for helping us to work it out up here and to work it during live stream. Oh, and there's more food outside. Yeah, I couldn't uh, try it. Yes, there is more food outside. Um, I want to thank uh, Marianne Fox and Jen Rock and Jackie for helping the audience to participate. Um, and as the President said, really being ambassadors and talking to others is important. So we want to thank the people who are watching this through live stream. Uh, we're excited to participate in that way and we plan on doing more events this way. Um, and if not other questions or comments, I'll turn it back to Dr. Russell. Dean. Uh, Dr. Russell, I just wanted to, as, as president of the Alumni Association, I just wanted to thank you for your openness and your uh, persistence with your program. I've been through a number of meetings, uh, the strategic plan, I was on the strategic planning committee for the uh, alumni and the community and participated in that. And uh, in, in the short time that you've been here, for us who've been associated with the college for 40 years or more, um, a lot of steps have taken, a lot of positive steps. And I would like to commend you and your cabinet for a job well done so far. I know there's a lot to do, but uh, I've been, I've sat through a, a, a number of meetings like this, Joe, as, as you know, um, and I just want to commend you and, and thank you for what you've done and how you've helped the college progress to the state that it is now and looking forward to a, a, a 
lot more great things. Thank, Thank you. you, Peter. I really appreciate that. And as I said uh, in many of these forums, and forums as well, uh, it doesn't happen a lot. As you said, you know, from the executive board of the alumni association to the terrific work of the board of trustees, who are now fully engaged in the institution, um, work that Don has done as, as, a, as a trustee. Uh, but also the cabinet members, and there are a few people you haven't met. So, would they please introduce themselves? Art? Uh, our, our class is our, our CFO, it's up here on my left. Uh, Don Felcher is our uh, special assistant, uh, and, and has been here. How many years now, Don? 14. John Smith has. John uh, Smith. <laughs> 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 I've never done that before. I've never, I've never done that before. Dean Brown has been here five years. I'll be going on my fifth year. And and uh, is in, in charge of uh, vice president uh, for student student affairs. Uh, Norm Jones, uh, a recent uh, arrival from Texas, is our uh, vice president for enrollment management and, and uh, uh, head of athletics. And did I miss anybody else who hasn't spoken? And uh, oh, Jim, well, uh, welcome to you as well. Thank you. Uh, our acting dean of uh, graduate and, and uh, uh, continuing education. And, uh, oh, so Roy Orton. This is a terrible way to do this in the program. <laughs> just had it all listed. Uh, Roy Orton is, is um, heading up the daily planning process. I was going to introduce, uh, I want to thank all the faculty members. Steve DeBrew, Dr. DeBrew came in. Uh, he's now the co chair of. Uh, I don't know the name of your department. <laughs> 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 or, or, and, uh, no, 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 no. no, no, no. Natural resources. Natural resources. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, uh, and let's see, did I miss anybody, anybody else? All right. Tom. Tom, well, Tom has been introduced, but Tom, what I was going to say is, is we, we, with, we've got uh, Bruce Richards and, and Tom Slane here as well. Thank you both for being here as well as, as, uh, as Steve and Bruce. Thank you for all your leadership. Um, so listen, let me just say in closing, two reasons I came to Del Val. I was thinking about this as people were talking. Came to Del Val because of the people, uh, because I was when I was going through the, the uh, fairly extensive interviewing process, I met a lot of people, and that was one of the things that, that inspired me both in terms of the, the faculty, the staff, the students, the trustees, and that turned out to be really true. That's the strength of the institution. We talk about that. Every everybody that I interviewed. When I first got here, um, from faculty to students to alumni, I always talked about the faculty-student relationship. Uh, I, I talked to people who were here 60 years ago, and they told me about the faculty-student relationship. I've talked to students who are here today, who talk about the faculty-student relationship. It is the strength of the institution. It's lasted for the, the lifetime of this place. Um, also, I think uh, the leadership of the cabinet and board, as I said, is a real strength for the institution. And finally, you know, we talked about the brand promise. I won't go into it again, but. The important thing is, if you look at the, at the questions surrounding food and food, I mean, I go into subsets of that, food and water, arable land, air quality, all of those questions are questions that this college has been dealing with in one way or the other for its history. It's not a fad here, but it's central to what's happening in the world today. It's improving all those pieces, solving some of the issues around all those people issues are central to the future of this country and to the world. Nothing less than that. And we're at the center of that. And that is, there's nothing more relevant than that. And to inspire people to make those changes, to engage in all that, is really a, a, a sacred and an important uh, commitment that we make as individuals who are engaged, in, whether they're faculty or staff or administration. So I, I promise you that we, will, we hold that sacred trust important and we will honor that and we will improve uh, and make a commitment to improve the quality and the and the, uh, and the value that each one of our students and I'd say alumni uh, as well get from being associated with this institution. I, this is a great place. I love being here and I'm proud to be part of this uh, uh, change and, and, and evolution. So thank you all for being part of this.
Correct.